Welcome once again to the Empowering Patients podcast, your weekly take on all things related to new care models in healthcare, remote patient monitoring, chronic care management, and hospital at home. I'm your host, Theo Harvey. I'm the co-founder of SensorMed, the leading full-service uh, remote patient monitoring platform in the industry. Today, I also have on the call our clinical manager, Anna. Hi, Anna. How are you today? Hey, how are you? Good. Well, look, today's going to be an interesting call. We're going to talk a little bit about strategies on how to keep patients engaged in long-term health monitoring at home. So I think this will be an important discussion. So uh, I, I, I look forward to it. Uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the news. So one thing I saw that was interesting in the news, uh, or not this week, was there was this a new India-based startup that uh, created a company called My Family First. And they're they're ch- trying to uh, the problem they're trying to solve is rural care. India's you know very f- uh, far to get access to a doctor, and so you know rural c- healthcare is really important for them. So the way they're kind of um, migrating this is yes, you can do uh, virtual care models, uh, telehealth, um, you know things of that nature. But what they're trying to do is build what they call a digitally enhanced enabled smart health or dish clinic, where basically a um, a, a paramedic will be in the clinic helping facilitate telehealth visits with, with a provider at another location. So um, so this is kind of an interesting model. And what they want to do is they want to be able to uh, franchise this. So basically, you know, you can buy one of these, these uh, dish clinics in different areas of the country. Uh, so I thought that was kind of very interesting and unique. And uh, one of the things I kind of want to you know, put it out there, you know, can this work in the U.S., right? Um, you know, uh, I've been in rural areas. I think you've been around some of the rural areas in Georgia. Uh, you know, what if there were these kind of clinics, you know, maybe at a Dollar General that people can go see a doctor, you know, remotely, but they're not just sitting in a room by themselves. They have someone that can help facilitate that care. Do you think that could work in the U.S.? Um, I, I think it, it, it could work. And I, I honestly see it working better in the U.S. than some of those other kind of even more rural countries, um, just because we're already kind of familiar with telehealth and kind of um, not the traditional way of, of seeing a doctor anyway. Um, and, and definitely, like you said, Dollar General, I think that's a big thing because when I think of rural, I think there's Dollar Generals in almost every rural spot. Um, and so it'll be convenient for patients um, and then maybe give those an opportunity to, to go visit and get the help that they need um, without getting too far out of the way and, and having to figure out how they're going to get there. So I think it's definitely something that could benefit everyone in those areas. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar in Georgia. They have ability for um, uh, children to get access to like a, a mental health professional um, through their um uh, telehealth options. And so they were actually, uh, the children would sit in the room and they'd be have a telehealth option to kind of talk to a specialist, you know, maybe at Emory, you know, or, or Choa. And so, um, so yeah, I do feel like, you know, having these kind of uh, rural centers across the country could be beneficial, but uh, unfortunately, just like anything in healthcare is tied into, uh, you know, what's the revenue model, right? Who gets reimbursed? How does that work? Um, some people have mentioned it could work better. Are you familiar with concierge medicine or direct primary care at all? Yes. So some people have mentioned that this could work better as a uh, kind of that model where you pay a monthly fee, right, to go see the doctor. But then instead of seeing a physical doctor, you go into a room and, you know, you get your lab works done by the, the nurse there or the, or, the, or the local clinician. But your more, you know, detailed analysis will be done by a doctor in another location. So. Um, so it's kind of interesting to kind of see how this evolves. But, um, you know, the pandemic has opened up a lot of different opportunities and, and, and new models. So so I thought that was kind of interesting kind of see where this was going. Um, so, yeah, more things to come. I mean, like I said, healthcare is always evolving. And so our goal is to kind of keep abreast of what's happening in the marketplace and um, how we can benefit uh, individuals as we listen to this podcast. So with that being said, let's transition to our agenda today. So one of the things that um, Anna and her team are really good at is understanding strategies on how to keep patients engaged for the long term, especially when they're in these health monitoring um, programs at home. So um, Anna, you know, I just want to get your take on that. Like, so let's discuss how you, your team think about engaging patients. You know, what is your high level thoughts of what's important when you put these patients on the, these uh, remote monitoring programs? Yeah, so um, kind of like how we discussed earlier already, um, you kind of have to set that expectation 
when you're introducing the program to the patients, you have to let them know, you know, this is not something short term. This is a long term condition that you're going to have, whether it's COPD, high blood pressure or diabetes. Um, and you want someone that's going to be there with you through the journey um, that can kind of coach you and help you and navigate that chronic um, condition and just give you support, whether it's education on how you can benefit from changing your diet or um, having someone that can kind of serve as like a facilitator between you and your doctor. Um, Cause we do have that kind of rapport with the patients. We're talking to them frequently. So just setting the expectation that, that you may need, may need us. It may be for several months that your blood pressures or your sugars look perfect. Um, then you have that one time where you have that spike and you just want someone who sees it and says, hey, we see it, we hear you. Um, what are the things that you're doing? How, we help. Um, so that's definitely important. And then um, just making sure that they are accountable for their health. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can only tell someone so much. It's it's their job to kind of follow through with that, right? Um, so if you have someone that's staying on top of it with you, giving you the weekly or the monthly calls, um, especially, you know, during COVID, because a lot of providers are offering telehealth. Um, some aren't. Some offices are closed. Um, and so, so patients are not getting the refills they need. They're not having that interaction with the medical professionals. So that's where we kind of step in and say, you know, we're still here. We're still looking at those. If you need anything, we can help you. We can educate you. We can get that information over to your doctor. So that's definitely important. Um, and just making sure all of the nurses are on the same page and, and we're working together to help each other and, and get that um, kind of best practice standard set across the board so that we know that we're delivering the best care to our patients. I love it. No, that's great um, points. Um, and, you know, personal story, I know, um, you know, during the pandemic, it was tough for my parents, you know, they're in their 60s and 70s to get a doctor. And so, you know, having somebody that was accountable too. So even if they couldn't see the doctor, you know, they still managed their healthcare because then when they went to go see the doctor again, after, you know, pandemic society and you know, doctor's offices start to open up, you know, their numbers were out of whack. Right. And so so I think, you know, to your point, um, having that accountability partner and we all need it. Right. I mean, even um, some of us that are a little bit younger. Right. But, you know, we're all suffering from different kind of conditions. So having that coach that's just there to kind of support you in that that long term care. Um, I think I think the patients value that. And I think that's important to, to for them to realize that's that's what they need. And so so I'll, I love that. I love that. Um, one of the questions that brought up was like, you know, so. I think one of the things that you guys do un uniquely is just like creating these kind of monthly training kind of goals, you know, with the patients, um, you know, based on like, not just, uh, you know, the healthy holidays, but just in general to help them with their health. So you can break up the monotony with the patient conversations. What are, you know, how do you go about creating that monthly training for these patients? Right. So um, I think at the end of every nursing call, one of the most important things that we try to do is, is set a goal for our patients. Um, and that can be a short term goal. It can be a long term goal. And typically we will see, you know, those goals are changing each month. Um, so, for example, um, I just spoke with a patient this morning and her blood pressure is very high. She's having back pain. Um, she's also really stressed because although she's in her 70s, she's taking care of her elderly mother who's 99. Oh. Um, and so they're actually both on the program together which is great because they can kind of keep each other accountable, but it's also a big stressor for the patient um, in particular whose blood pressure was elevated. Um, so one of her goals was how can we manage her stress and how can we get her blood pressure down? Um, she's not sleeping well at night. And that was another thing that was really affecting her health overall, especially her blood pressure. So our goal for this month was what can we do to, to alleviate some of that stress that you have? And we kind of talked through that process and, by the end of it, we kind of came to agreement that it might be useful for her to hire some kind of some kind of help. Maybe it's a home health aide or nurse who comes in and just assist her um, by helping her mother. Because, you know, in that situation, how can you help someone else if you are down? It's hard enough to, to take care of yourself um, when you're feeling sick and when you're not in the best health, let alone, you know, caring for someone else. So um, we talked through that and I just educated her that, you know, Bringing in that support doesn't mean that, you know, you're leaving your mother behind or, you, you know, you can't do it, but it's helping you help her in the long run. And it's going to be beneficial for her health. So um, we just kind of it's a situation kind of case by case situation. So 
each goal is different and we try to cater to the patient. Um, so we're educating for this one in particular, sleep, stress. So just listening to the patient, having that rapport so they feel comfortable telling you kind of helps us help them. Um, so definitely just education is top priority when it comes to, to doing these trainings and listening to the patient. No, great example. And uh, I think about, you know, they always tell you on the plane, make sure you take care of yourself first with the oxygen and then you help someone else. And so so I think that's really good, great advice that you're giving to patients. And and I think there's uh, some studies have shown that a lot of older patients, uh, older individuals who are also caregivers. And so that can add to the stress. Right. So so um, so that is definitely something of, of note. So so great, great, great um, example. Um, one of the last things I want to kind of ask, what are, um, you know, what are some of the best practices? So obviously you're having this rapport with patients, you know, but you can only do so much. And there's a time when they need to go see their, you know, PCP or a specialist, primary care physician or a specialist. So how do you think about best practice in ensuring there's a seamless communication channel between you as a remote nurse and the doctor? What are some, some thoughts around that? Yeah, I think that, um, that's definitely, that's key in, in doing our job and doing it effectively. So, the best way to make it seamless is when you're on a call with a patient, make sure you're documenting it clear, it's concise, so that you can refer to it. And then also the doctor who, who's managing this patient can refer on to it. And then using our escalation sheets appropriately. Um, if we have, if we see an elevated reading, it's, it's, it's easy to copy and paste a reading and put it on the sheet. But just going into more detail and saying, hey, you know, I spoke with this patient today. X, Y, and Z is happening um, just so that you know. And this could be affecting their numbers this week. Um, or, you know, they may need additional support here. So just making sure that line of communication is clear and um, you're giving all the information that you can that we, that's, able to, or that's available to us, um, to your provider. I think that's definitely going to help. And um, I think that because we kind of send out those escalations weekly. It sets us apart because we kind of have information that we're able to give. So, um, yeah, I think the best way to do it is just open lines of communication. I love it. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, the patients that we service, the thousands of patients, I think they, they value that as well, just having someone that uh, can help them because I know communication sometimes between the patient and doctor can be difficult, especially if the doctor's only seeing them like once every three months or once a year. So I think, um, you know, just having that continuum of care is really helping patients long term. So so that's great. What Anna, as always, thank you for your time. This has been great, insightful information. Uh, again, everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, that's our show for today. But please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Also follow us on Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn at Censorment. Uh, thank you for being this journey with us toward empowering patients to better health. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you.